As Mike said, I'm the chief operating officer for a global software company called SAP. I've been in this country for 14 years. I started my career when I was in graduate school. Obviously, for anyone that speaks more than a couple of languages, you probably you know, can lead to the fact that I had to be educated to speak all of those languages. I've got two bachelor's degrees, two master's degrees. In fact, I wanted to get my, my doctorate, and my dad called me the perpetual student. He forbade me to going to school thinking I didn't want to go out into the workforce, which is probably a little bit true. Nonetheless, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey first. Um, I went to a public school outside of New York City. Um, not a particularly good one. It was, you know, average, as one would say. Um, I hung out with a popular crowd. So the popular crowd usually doesn't coincide with the most educated and smartest, best grades, if you will. I was probably the less cool, the, the, the smartest one, per se, in my journey. Um, in fact, I was the only one that didn't want to own delis or marry a policeman or a firefighter. Um, my uncle owned a couple of Lee Miles transmissions. I don't know if, you've, if anyone's ever heard of that, but in the US 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, my dad ended up being a, a very successful businessman. He was one of the original founders of the Home Shopping Network. That happened a little bit later in my life. I think home shopping probably everybody does know. But as a young girl during you know, formative years, all of my friends went on to be um, you know, secretaries and nurses. And whilst that's great, they never continued their education because they didn't recognize the importance of it. They didn't have anyone showing them that you know, they could be more. They're questioning what they were doing, what they wanted. And their journey went a little bit astray, different from mine, I would say. So I think for me, a big part of where I ended is where I began, which is the influence I had. In addition to helping every you know, one woman and one girl at a time, a, a big mantra for me is you can't be what you can't see. And that goes extremely well for influential children at age 6 to 16 in particular. You can't be what you can't see. And that's the founder for school's premise. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Going forward, I went off. I said to my mom, my parents were divorced at the time. My mother was the, was the main provider. She worked four jobs, one ironically in a high street bank. Um, or not high street, but the version of a high street bank, since we don't have those in New York, but in a high street bank. Um, she worked for catering. She was a waitress. She answered phones and an answering service during the nights. So when I said to her, hey, should I like start studying for my SAT? Should I go to uni? She was like, ah, you know, I turned out fine. So what, you know, if you want to, you can. It's kind of not really that important. But I started getting put into advanced placement classes in school. So I started, like, I was craving education. I was craving knowledge. I wanted to study. I wanted to learn more. I didn't want to study Spanish in school. I wanted to study Russian. I didn't want to learn French. I wanted to learn Chinese. I wanted to learn Farsi. I wanted, I wanted more. It's like I was a sponge at the time. And that was influenced a lot in a big part because of my uncle, who was the entrepreneur. He was the rich one in our family because he owned two transmissions um, outfits, stations. But it, it inspired me in, an, in a really unique way to say, oh, what is it like to be an entrepreneur? Have your own business. And my dad went on, obviously, to do great things you know, a little bit later. But you know, the, the, the exposure to him really altered my life. I did go off um, to graduate school. I got my master's degree and my MBA. I was getting my MBA, and the dean of my business school at the time said to me, what are you going to do with this education of yours? I said, I originally came to Washington, DC, because I wanted to be a politician. I wanted to be in government. I wanted to be a translator. He said, oh, you're never going to pay 50 grand. I owned 150 grand for, for your education. You're never going to be able to do it. You ought to get in this SAP thing. It's kind of catching on. He somehow, in a really unique way, got me into coding. And that's where my journey began into technology. I never got out of it. I stayed in technolo technology my entire professional life. But because of that really simple, easy exchange with someone who was my informal mentor, he said, hey, how about I didn't have exposure, and most of my friends in the school didn't have exposure to people like us, to people just every day that you pass, people that you come across, people that you work with, bank with, study with, sit next to in the tube. I didn't have any exposure to those kind of people at all. I somehow find my way, luckily, and then I began, began to see my first versions of informal mentors. I do a lot of talking about the importance of mentors, particularly in children. They're young and impressionable. If you can't see, you can't be. You can't imagine what there is. For me at the time, in my early part of my career, the only female leader I could find was Carly Fiorina. Do you remember her? Yeah, she was the CEO of HP. She was the only female leader for a technology company. And in fact, her security came up to me three times and said, stop stalking her. Like, what is wrong with you, kid? Get out of the front row. <laughs> Wherever she went, I'd find my way. Because she was the only beacon of example of light that I had. She was the only person that, that looked like me 
that I could look up to and think, oh, man, there's, I could do something a little bit different because in my neighborhood, in my town, and you know, we were middle class, we weren't, we weren't you know, Surrey Square, um, but you know, we were, we, you know, we were all firemen and policemen, we were good, we were good, hardworking people, but we didn't have the beacon of hope that we had. I got recruited straight out of business school. I mean, I spoke you know, seven languages. I studied Farsi, Russian, which were really quite good. If you wanted to be a spy, I couldn't keep a secret, so I got disqualified on the first application. <laughs> they were like, yeah, not so good. Um, so I went off for Price Waterhouse. They recruited me straight out of school, now PwC, as you well know them. Um, I, I got recruited straight out of school to implement and, and code SAP around the world. So I don't want to spend my whole talk talking about me, that's for sure. I want to talk more about the educational experience and what I think we can all do. It's not about what's wrong, it's about what we can do to fix things and make things better. Everyone in this room can have an impact. I want to leave you with a call to action. I want to, I want to, I want to you know, inspire you profoundly to do more for your community as it pertains to education. It's been critical for my life. I wouldn't be here where I am today. I mean, I hear these things like we don't need an MBA and all this. And, you know, I, I have three children, and my daughter does walk around, sorry to say, with a future Oxford student T-shirt. Okay, I'm a victim. I know it. Um, yes, and she's, you know, she. I'm pushing her for education. I want. I love it. I'm, I love education, and I will continue to do so for my children because I do want to have the most opportunities for them. And that's the way that I feel. But I feel what's more important for them is experiences and encounters, and that's the premise of Founders for Schools. Um, going back to uh, when the premise of you can't be what you can't see, our charity, Founders for Schools, wants to ensure that every young person in our society in the UK have every bit of access to at least one encounter with one employer a year while they're between the ages of 6 and 16, and that they gain at least 140 hours of work experience between the ages of 16 and 24. Not like any of the other speakers, but ones that we can have an impact on doing. I'm not in Parliament, and, I'm, and I don't have time to you know, to, to raise flags and jump up and down. But what I do have time to do, and I am capable of giving, is my time, is visibility and giving back, and like I'm doing here with all of you. These encounters and experiences improve the employability, improve the employability of our children by enabling them to make informed decisions about their future, to see what they're capable of. Students have access to business leaders and communities. They're inspired. They're inspired to experience what it's like to work in a diverse range of, of companies, fast growing, creative, technology, social enterprise parts of jobs, even crazy places like a software company like me. I have an employee that works for me um, at home, and he, is, he lives in Surrey, Cobham, a very affluent place, I think, quite affluent place, a very nice place to live. Um, you know, but he spent a lot of his time being a driver. Um, and, and he didn't have access for his two twin sons, who are now 22. And he said to me a couple of weeks ago, is there any chance I can get Elliot an unpaid work experience? He's 22, and he's been trying for eight years, and no one will even speak to him. And I don't know anyone but you. I gave him a work experience at SAP, and paid, because we don't allow unpaid. Uh, and that's transformed his life. He's now got direction. He's, he's been inspired. He's had a profound change on who he is at 22. The problem, indeed, that we have, of course, is immediate. It's insistent. According to the UN, for example, 470 million jobs are needed globally for new entrants to the labor market between 2016 and 2030. That's our lifetime, by the way. Um, and, but more than 60% of the world's 1.2 billion adolescents will not receive a full secondary education and the skills they need to actually do basic roles and basic jobs. That's by UNICEF. So many of these tech startups say, I could have grown faster if I, if I employed more of the adolescents that come out with skills that are employable, basic skills. Our charity wants to work with others to influence decision makers, of course, policy makers, et cetera, but more importantly, with leaders, individuals, citizens like yourselves and our youth to ensure that we are addressing the skills crisis. I'm personally, single-handedly, not going to be able to train my three kids or yours on the importance necessarily of technology, for example. But what I can do is inspire them. I can be the beacon of what you can be. I can be visible. I can offer job roles in an informal way without having to be one of 25,000 applicants going into the schemes. So Gatsby Foundation, and I'll wrap with this, but Gatsby Foundation has set up eight benchmarks for good career guidance as it has for employers and students. And I really like these. Every school and college should have an embedded program for, for career education and guidance. 
In fact, the only reason why I ended up in university was because we have something in the states called a guidance counselor. It's a free resource that's provided for all children during your formative years until you're 18 that you're allowed to go in, knock on their door and say, hey, you know, do I take SATs? Do I not? How, how do I go to uni? That sort of thing. Every pupil and their parents should have access to good quality information about what future studies are. Pupils have different, different career guidance at different stages. The opportunities that we can give as individuals by speaking in schools, being present, and offering our time, not our money, is more valuable and have a much more profound effect on their results. Bringing real life subjects, real life experiences and stories makes it all and puts it all into context for them, giving them life skills that are not otherwise obtained. Every pupil will have multiple opportunities to learn from employers at work. That's a really important part of the role that we can all play. And every pupil should have at some point of their journey firsthand experience in the workplace, even if it's just a workplace visit. What that workplace visit, even if it means you come to a tech company and you get free peanuts, they still love it. Every pupil should understand the learning opportunities and they should be guided for interviews by being involved in many of the companies that we all can work in and work for. My challenge to all of you is to think not about what money can do for education for children, but more for about what you can do by being present. In fact, the issue of employability skills could be impacted well more in a profound way by our children by having visibility to leaders, employees, citizens, companies, entrepreneurs, and all of you in this money well more than money can ever have. An impact for a short talk, a visit, invite a school to walk through your office, invite them to your shop, whether it be large or small, could really have an imprint on who they become. It did for me, and I think it probably will be for my children. Visibility to leaders, individuals, giving their time and advice, not only can transform their way of thinking and what they could be, but it also shows the importance of philanthropy and giving back. It will leave an imprint of giving back to society throughout their life. We can all pick it up and make it transformative. Our education system is a hell of a lot better here than it is in the US. <laughs> but you didn't invite me to talk about the US educational system, nor was I asked to come talk about what the problems necessarily are with our educational system here. But what I do want to leave you with is the call to action, what we can do to make the lives of our children much more impactful in the opportunities that they have during their careers.